Good evening, my friends. I trust that uh, you are all keeping well. Uh, at the moment, my family as well, thank goodness. Uh, we are grateful to the Lord for keeping us well. And I trust that you are not feeling uh, too badly confined to your home, that you are finding ways of having fellowship with people in spite of the restrictions that have been imposed upon us. I'm going to read this evening from Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick it up from verse 14 and read it to the end of verse 19. However, we are only going to pick up Paul's second part of the prayer from verse 17b onwards. So I'll come back to those verses just so that we don't get confused. But to put it in its broader context, I'm going to read from verse 14. So verse 14 from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want to pick up on the second part of this prayer, which comes from verse 17b. And he says, And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We're going to look at those two verses in a little bit more detail, and I trust that they will prove somewhat helpful to you. Let's pray and ask that God help us in this process. Our Father, we bow before you this evening, wanting to give thanks to you because you have blessed us with so much. It's impossible for us to measure your blessings. It's impossible for us to Make a list of everything that we have received from you. One of the wonderful gifts that we experience is the wonder of your love. And as we spend some time this evening trying to explore something of your love, we confess that, Lord, this is almost an impossible task. But nevertheless, we ask for your help. We ask for your assistance. May you give us insight that we lack, and may you communicate something more of the immensity of your love to us. And we ask that as you do that this evening, you would help me, the preacher, it's your church, it's your people, it's your word, it's your glory. May I shrink, and may Christ be exalted. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. In 1997, just before Janice and I were due to come to Australia, to emigrate to Australia, we were ministering to Janice's uncle who had a brain tumor and a tumor in the lung. He was dying from cancer. He wasn't an old man. He was in his early 40s. He had a young family, two young daughters, and an even younger son. And he was lying in bed and wasting away. And as we went to visit him and would read scripture with him and pray with him, there were times where I would try and enter into a conversation and just find out how he was traveling. It's very difficult when someone's dying. You don't want to say too much. Uh, you don't want to ask insensitive questions. You don't want to say insensitive words. And so I try to tiptoe carefully around just how he was going. But I wanted to know so that it would help me to pray intelligently for him. 
And as we were speaking, I don't know how we got onto the subject, but somehow we got onto the love of God and how vast God's love was. And I asked him a question somewhere along the lines that now that you're experiencing your sickness and it's going to ultimately end in you dying, how do you feel about your faith, your relationship with God? And I'll never forget the words, as you can see, I remember them to this day. He looked me in the eye and he said to me, if there's one thing I know, Ian, I know this, Jesus loves me. In the midst of his life ebbing away, and he died just a few weeks later, he was able to say with absolute confidence, Jesus loves me. And it's important for us to be able to understand the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we go through those kinds of trials, when our faith is being stretched to the utmost limit, it's very easy for us to doubt sometimes the wonder of God's love. And I think that's, this is coupled with the fact that because non-Christians don't always understand how God's love functions, in their ignorance, they may turn around and, and make such statements as, how can you believe in a loving God when he allows people to die like this from this virus, this coronavirus? Surely if God loved us, he would provide some kind of antidote much quicker, or surely he wouldn't even bring this along until we had an antidote. And all kinds of questions when we go through trials can often be leveled at God, or God can be accused of, of somehow lacking in love. And what Paul does is he writes to the Ephesian church, is he reminds them of God's indescribable love and it is indescribable there is a sense in which it's impossible to really get to grips with the depths of God's love and the paradox is this as we will see we are told to learn and to grasp more of God's love God's completely indescribable in comprehensible love and it's important that we understand that because it goes to the very essence of our faith as Christians if we don't if our understanding of God's love for some reason is limited or restricted it's going to affect our ability to relate to him and so it's very very important if we are going to continue growing as believers, that we understand God's love in Christ. Come with me as we have a look at what that looks like in this passage. Firstly, I want you to notice Christ's love is foundational. It is foundational. Look at verse 17b. He makes that quite clear when he says the following. I pray that you being rooted and established in love. That's a very important phrase, those two words. Rooted and established in love. Now when Paul talks about your establishment or being rooted in love. He's thinking back to the fact that the love you have experienced is the result of God's predetermined decision in eternity to set his love upon you. You are not just loved randomly. You are loved because in eternity past, before you were created, before you became a thought in your parents' minds, God set his love upon you. You are, if I can put it like this, the product of God's love. 
You are the result of God's love. Thus in Ephesians 1 verse 4, he makes this statement, For he chose us in him, when? Before the creation of the world. To be what? To be holy and blameless in his sight. We were chosen before the foundation of the world to be in him. And thus it is God's love in which we have been grounded, in which we have been established. It is in God's love in which our security is found. God's love that has been directed towards us is not something that will ever fail, not something that will ever fluctuate. It is not something that will be withdrawn from us. It is not dependent upon your behavior or conformity to an ethical standard. It is always dependent upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He loves you because he died for you. And his love has reached out to you. It has plucked you out of the pit of hell. And it has established you. And it has given you a firm foundation. It is your security. And therefore, since you have been secured in God's love, there is no reason for you under any circumstances ever to doubt just how much he loves you. Just how much he cares for you. It is your foundation upon which your faith is built. And you need to stand upon that foundation. For God's love in Christ cannot be shaken. And no matter what trial or storm may come, that foundation that he has set remains exactly the same as when you first came to Christ. It is your foundation. It is not based upon an emotion, and I want you to see that and understand that. Our emotions fluctuate. If you've been in any kind of a relationship with anyone, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's with children or parents, it doesn't matter. You know that sometimes emotionally you may fluctuate in your feelings. You may have a bad day and emotionally feel down and perhaps emotionally not feel that love. God wants our love not to be based on how our feelings are going, but based upon the certain reality of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is based, in other words, in an objective truth. He died for us. That's the expression of his love. Rest in it. Abide in it. Take comfort in it. Find security in it. James Dobson, in one of his videos, for those of you who don't know, James Dobson is a Christian psychologist and he has directed his work in his life primarily towards children. And he spoke about once when they were traveling on a truck from the, at the bottom of a mountain to the top to where there was a campsite that they were going and while they were all in the back of that truck, there was a young girl standing up and her arms were outstretched like this. And with a bit of a blank look in her eyes, she was saying, whomever, whomever, whomever. And as the other young people who were in that truck looked at her and observed her standing there, you could see uh, them look in their eyes with a bit of this Girl is a little bit strange. This girl is a bit weird. This is the kind of girl you, you, you don't want to spend time with. You could see that distancing happening. And when you looked into her eyes, you could also see in this girl's eyes that there was obviously some kind of uh, intellectual inability that she had. There was some kind of problem that she had been born with that was coming out. 
And as she stood on the back of that truck saying, whomever, a man stood up, a great big hulking man, and he walked up to this girl and he enclosed her in his big arms and he pulled her close to his breast and he said, yeah, babe, whomever, whomever. The man was her father. And here was a man who knew his daughter's difficulties, yet he loved her in spite of that. He wasn't embarrassed to be associated with her. He wasn't embarrassed to embrace her and pull her close to his breast. He loved her. And it didn't matter that she had some difficulty. He reached out to her. And he said to all of those kids on that truck, I love my daughter. You are children of God. Jesus Christ has purchased you with his blood. He paid the ultimate price. And it doesn't matter that you might be not living the way that you ought if you belong to him, if you truly belong to him. It doesn't matter whether others don't love you. It doesn't matter whether you've got a few strange quirks to your personality. We all have, don't we? It doesn't matter whether you are shunned by others. It doesn't matter whether others don't want to associate with you or don't talk to you or don't invite you out when they go out. All that matters is Jesus puts his arms around you and he says, I love you. I love you. That my dear friends, is your security. Rest in his love in these difficult times. His love for you has not changed, but he continues to express it towards you. Secondly, I want you to notice that Christ's love is immeasurable. Christ's love is immeasurable. Look at verse 18. And again, I will read the verse. Verse 18, that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge. Now, it's very, very interesting the way that he phrases that. He begins by saying that you might grasp. Now, that little word there in the original language is a very, very interesting word. It literally means that I have overcome a whole lot of obstacles in my way in order to grasp the object or the goal of what I was trying to achieve. So in this case, it is to grasp God's love in Christ. I've overcome whatever my personal obstacles are or insecurities may be. And I have overcome all of those so that I've attained the goal of understanding something about the incomprehensibility of the love of Jesus Christ. It is an active word when it, it, it is used. Um, and, and it is a word that talks about our ability to strive to achieve that goal, to ensure that we don't just passively sit back and do nothing about it. Uh, literally, the word means to fully understand. And there is so much to understand that it requires a lifetime of pursuing after God's love and not giving up too quickly 
or too easily, particularly when things get difficult, particularly when the devil might come and introduce doubts into our mind and begin to say to us, ah, oh, you think God really loves you? Look what you're going through now. Look what you're experiencing me. How can you know that God loves you now? God says, persevere through that. Keep on persevering to grasp that I do love you in those circumstances, no matter how desperate your situation might be. That's the knowledge he speaks of here too, that knowing is not simply an intellectual knowledge. You know, at one level, you and I can talk about God's love in, in wonderfully glowing terms. That's easy. Anyone can do that. We can talk about how God has expressed his love and how we have seen this love manifest in Christ throughout his life and how the apostles strove to tell others about the love of Christ. We, we can talk all around God's love. But when the Apostle Paul talks about understanding or grasping God's love, it's not just an intellectual understanding, though our intellect must be informed. Rather, it's an experiential knowledge of his love. This isn't just love in the dark. This is love that I have personally been able to experience in my Christian walk that has informed me and has enabled me to understand how much God loves me in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was much younger, and we're going back when I was in my early 20s, in South Africa they held for young people a summer camp. And the summer camp involved all of the Baptist churches in the whole of South Africa. And so all the different youth groups from the different churches would come together at this summer camp and they would have to run two because there were too many young people coming in one go. And we would have roughly, when I was on the first camp I went on, there were roughly about 1,200 young people on that camp. And one of the leaders had made a, a makeshift electric cushion and he would put this cushion on a chair. And then the challenge would go out to two individuals who would then come up onto stage and they would sit, in fact he had two cushions, they would sit on these cushions that he had made. And they each had a little buzzer, a button in their hand. And there was a bulb with three lights. It was a green light, an orange and a red. And as soon as it turned from green to orange and the red light on the first person to push the button, would shock the other person on the chair. Now, naturally, it wasn't AC going through there. It was DC. And this would create great laughter because you would be watching intently. And as those lights changed, you would push your button for all your worth. And whoever pushed it first shocked the other person. Well, I'd watch this going on. And there was a particular guy in the youth group that I thought I was going to challenge. And we did this outside of that time while we were not on stage. I happened to know the man who had made the cushions. And we both sat down on these chairs. And I'd watched it from a distance. I'd seen what happened. I knew the process. I knew the procedure. And then when we got those things on and that light changed and I pushed the button, I was too late. And the other person pushed quicker than I did. And I ended up getting shocked and I jumped up out of that seat. And I have a photograph in my photo album of me jumping out of that seat being shocked. Now, I'd not only seen what had happened, I'd not only seen what others had experienced, now it had become personal. Now I knew exactly what it felt like. That's what he's talking about. It's that kind of experiential knowledge that you can say, I felt the pain coursing through my backside and the rest of my body when I got shocked. I know what you others experienced who had the same experience. It's that that the Apostle Paul is wanting us to understand about knowing God's love. And it's this love that he speaks about elsewhere in Scripture. And when, uh, he says in 1 John 3 verse 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Or 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us 
and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Or 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Paul then uses a number of metaphors to describe this love. He says it's high, it's long, it's wide, it's broad. And all of these words are meant to help us to see that so great is the depths of love that God has towards us that all the verses I've just read to you about God's love cannot ultimately fully explore the extent of the love God has for us in Christ. There is a sense that we can keep on learning experientially more and more and more and we can get transported into eternity and we will continue for all eternity learning more and more and more about the love of God in Christ. That's how great God's love is. But more importantly, you must see that it's that love that God has lavished on you if you are his child. It is the love that reached down through the Lord Jesus Christ and sent him to the cross so that in eternity, when God set his love upon you and he saw you in eternity, he sent his son to die on that cross, to take upon himself your sin, to take upon himself all that is wrong with you, to suffer that shame, to suffer that pain, to suffer that humiliation, so that you could know and experience the depths of his love by having your sins forgiven in Christ. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he cares for you. Now, notice also what he says, that this surpasses knowledge. It's impossible for us ever to get to the point where we would be able to sit down and document all of God's love. You know, when I think about that, it often reminds me of what's going on with exploration of the universe and the stars. These men, these astronomers who get onto these telescopes and they look out into the stars and they discover new stars and as uh, more and more get revealed, they see greater and greater vastness to this universe and it's almost an inexhaustible vastness. We are still discovering things and long after I'm gone, we will still be discovering things. God's love is even greater than that. Because you can never, ever, no matter how long you've got, discover all of it. That's how much he loves you. And it's important, therefore, that you allow that love to take hold of your heart. And you see, it's because of this inability to know all of God's love that Paul prays that God would strengthen us and help us to get to know that love. Since we can't know it all, the only way that we can know what there is to know is by God enabling us through his divine power to understand what we can understand about God's love. And thus Paul prays that we would indeed come to understand it more, even though we will never understand it fully. Those two things must always be held in tension. The fact that we will never know all of it, but the fact that we are to strive after knowing it with the strength that God provides. So, oh, my dear friends, in the midst of all this uncertainty and turmoil and wondering about what's going to happen in the next couple of months and wondering whether or not we're going to survive this okay and what the future is going to look like and, and where I may end up, can I encourage you to remember and to reflect upon 
the love of God in Christ. Whatever else may happen to you, whatever else may unfold, know this, that if you are a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are loved by God in Christ with an incomprehensible love that no one can ever take away from you. Thirdly, I want you to see that Christ's love is transformative. Christ's love is transformative. Look at verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that, that, here's the result, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What on earth does the Apostle Paul mean by that? How do I get filled by all the fullness of God? What is he saying? I think he's saying something exceptionally important for us to, to integrate into our faith. He's reminding us that as a Christian, if you are ever going to become more like Christ, if your faith is ever going to mature and become more rounded, the only way that that is going to occur is if you are continually growing in your grasp, in your understanding of the depths of Christ's love for you. In other words, your spiritual maturity is dependent, is contingent upon you growing in your understanding experientially of the love of God in Christ. You cannot mature as a Christian. You cannot grow in your faith until you grasp how much God loves you. It's very easy to neglect this part of our faith. It's very easy to think that somehow we can grow by setting aside this one uh, aspect of our Christian life. But Paul is trying to emphasize that if you are going to experience more of the fullness of God, and what he means by that is the presence of God in your life. He doesn't just mean the presence, but he also means as you experience more and more of his power in your life, more and more of his life in your life, more and more of his rule in your life. As you experience God more comprehensively, it only occurs with respect to growing in the love of Jesus Christ. That's radical, don't you think? Because here is God saying to you, if you want to know my person more fully in your day-to-day -day experience, if you want to see Christ formed more and more in your person, if you want to keep moving forward as a Christian and not remain static in your relationship with me, then you must spend time learning to see and understand how much I love you. Because your spiritual well-being, your spiritual health is dependent upon how much you grasp God's love. It's a little bit, I suppose, if I can use this to try and make it uh, real for you. It's a little bit like being in a relationship with someone, isn't it? Just think of the relationships you have with people. As you draw closer to someone, as you come to know more and more about that person, particularly in the marriage relationship, so the love for that person ought to ever be increasing. I would hope that every husband and every wife would able, be able to say of their partner 
that they are more in love with them now than when they first met them. And as we begin to grasp more and more about who God is and all that God has done and all that he has revealed to us, so that ought to grow in us a greater appreciation of the immensity of his love. And as that occurs, you are going to be more and more transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. If your spiritual walk is being stunted, if you are no further down the line this year than you were at the same time last year, then perhaps it's because you've neglected this part of your walk with God that you haven't spent time in the Word plummeting into the depths of how God has revealed His love in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps you need to turn over the pages of Scripture more and more and you need to spend more time in reflection, more time in meditation, more time reading and pausing and praying and asking that God, through the reading that you are doing in his word, might continue that transformation process that he began when he saved you, of conforming you more and more into the character, into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another aspect to this transformation that the Apostle Paul also wants to help us to remember. That while we are in a journey in this world, and while we continue to be transformed in an ongoing way, that process of transformation culminates with the second coming of Christ. At that moment, all of the work of Christ on the cross will be fully realized in all of God's people as we are changed in the words of Paul to the Thess Thessalonians in the blink of an eye when Christ is revealed and when we are caught up with him and we go to live with him forever, then finally all of the work that Christ accomplished on the cross, all that he achieved, all of his merits will be applied in the sense that we will be like him, we will be fully transformed. But until then, until that moment, we are encouraged, we are urged by Paul to strive with all of our strength and the strength that God gives us to come to understand how much he loves us. So let me ask you some questions this evening. Do you really believe that God loves you so much? that even in the worst of your trials and even in the worst behavior of your Christian life, that his love hasn't changed one iota? Do you really believe that? Do you sometimes doubt God's love when spiritually your life is in a mess? Do you sometimes wonder if God could still love you when you've repeated that same old sin again and again and again? Do you sometimes inadvertently push Christ away? Because when you look at the state of your life, you think, how can God love such a wretch like me? Remember that God loves you not because you measure up, but God loves you because his son measured up. Because his son did what you cannot do. Because his son met the standard that you will never meet. And it's for the sake of his son who paid the ultimate penalty for your sin, who died to set you free. 
and to bring you into a relationship with God. That God's love towards you in Christ will never, ever change. So don't doubt it. Don't question it. Don't second guess it. Rest in him and in him alone. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the incredible love that you have demonstrated in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we as such mere mortals ever comprehend that? How do we understand the incomprehensible? Well, it's impossible. We need your help. We need your grace. We need your strength. We need you to enable us to gain a deeper appreciation and understanding of just how much you love us. What should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, have secured your love. O oh Lord, thank you that you love us like that. When all else has forsaken, when everyone else has left us, when we're all alone, help us to remember your love. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I have included also two songs for you uh, in this at the end. They will be reflected here. Uh, the first song is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And the second one, just in case you have some children who might be awake, is the one Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. I trust that you will enjoy those songs. They will also be sent to you via an email link. May the Lord bless you real good. Amen.